Thank you very much. I should also hasten to add that I am the father-in-law of Dr. Ben Reinhardt, who also teaches here and uh, just drove back from Steubenville where he and my daughter Hannah and their three kids, along with Michael and Anna and their five kids, had what we call a staycation at our home. Steubenville does not have a zoo, but last week we didn't need one. <laughs> with our eight grandkids, all eight years of age and under, actually we have 14, and our son Gabriel's about to adopt their seventh, so we'll have 15 here within the next week or so. It's always fun for me to come back here to Front Royal, not only to visit family, but also to renew my bond of affection and admiration for Christendom College and for all of the fine work that Tim and the board and the faculty and the students here, what an amazing heritage that is. Let's unite our hearts together in a word of, in a word of prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for our fathers on earth. We thank you for our dads. We thank you for our coaches and especially for our priests and bishops. We also lift up to you our Holy Father, Pope Francis. And in the name of Jesus, we pray for you to pour out the Holy Spirit upon the whole mystical body of Christ, extended as it is in mystery from heaven to earth, to the lowest layperson. We also thank you for this time together, this day that we have to reflect upon your word to open ourselves to your Holy Spirit. So lead us, teach us, and hear us as we pray that family prayer Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin with a reading from St. Paul in his epistle to the Ephesians. There we read, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Without getting into the grammatical intricacies of the Greek there in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, I might propose a more literal and precise translation. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named. That would be a more precise and literal rendering but I don't wish to quibble. I just wish to focus our attention upon the fact of fatherhood, which we've already heard so much wisdom about from Dr. O'Donnell. But I'd like to focus especially upon the importance of our Heavenly Father and how it is that we have a calling to be his beloved sons and daughters. Since we've been quoting John Paul the Great so much, let me begin with a quotation from him. One cannot truly protect the family without getting to its roots, its profound reality, its intimate nature, as a communion of persons made in the image and likeness of the Holy Trinity. Our family on mission is an extension of the Trinity on mission. And then elsewhere he states the following, the father-son paradigm in particular is ageless. It is older than human history. For the rays of fatherhood, for the rays of fatherhood belong to the Trinitarian mystery of God himself, which shines forth from him, illuminating human history. We know from Revelation, the rays of fatherhood meet a first resistance in the real fact of original sin. This is truly the key to interpreting reality. Original sin is not only the violation of a positive command of God, but also, and above all, a violation of the will of the Divine Father expressed in that command. For original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood, destroying its rays which permeate the created world, placing in doubt the truth about God who is love, 
and leaving man only with a sense of the master-slave relationship, close quote. I think it's interesting that John Paul points out that original sin does not turn us into atheists, but mere slaves. It doesn't abolish the reality of God, which is so ineradicable to our reason and experience, but it transforms the face of God, the Father, into a master who sees only slaves, a kind of master-slave relationship that is at the heart of the religion of Islam. I'm not going to go into any details here, but I just want to share briefly an experience that I had several years ago that sort of opened my eyes to the mystery of divine fatherhood. I was scheduled to debate a Muslim scholar at Penn State. My brother-in-law had arranged for this, and so about a half a year before the debate was scheduled, I was out visiting my sister and her family, and at dinner, my brother-in-law, Bill, got there late, all out of breath, and he was excited, and I didn't know why, and he explained that this particular scholar also happened to be passing through State College that same week. And I thought that was interesting. I'd frankly put the debate out of my mind for the vacation. But then he said, we are going to get together for breakfast to discuss the parameters of this debate tomorrow morning. Some vacation, Bill. <laughs> so we got down there, and we said a prayer. We walked in. The restaurant was empty. It was only about 7.15 a.m., so we ordered a cup of coffee, and I said, we should probably go home and just have your wife make us some eggs. And then we saw this dark, this tall stranger walking with a turban. We stood up, we shook hands, we exchanged pleasantries, and we sat down. And after just the greetings, he, jo he just jumped into the subject matter for the debate because he told us he had just come from a university campus uh, a week before where he had held another public debate on the subject matter of the Trinity like we would do. And so he was very triumphant in his tone. And so we tried our best to engage each other. And about three or four minutes into this conversation, I referred to God as Father. And down his fist came on the table. And he looked at me and he said, do not blaspheme in my presence. And I wasn't sure exactly what I had said. Perhaps I had contracted Tourette's syndrome. I wondered what is so blasphemous here. He said, fatherhood is human, not divine. It's finite, it's not infinite. To ascribe this to Allah is the essence of blasphemy. So I went on, we changed the subject. We began talking about Jesus and the prophets and so on. About four minutes later, I referred to Jesus as the Son of God, and once again, a second time, his fist came down even louder and harder. And he said, I've asked you once, and I'll ask you twice, but not again, do not blaspheme. And once more, I asked him to illuminate the matter because I didn't think that I had. And so he went on to explain that just like fatherhood, so sonship is not an attribute of God. And to ascribe this to the deity is, again, blasphemous. So I began wondering, how are we going to be debating the Trinity in six months? But I wasn't about to pose that question. Instead, I stepped back and I said, let's identify some common ground that we seem to share because you and I both understand the notion of analogy in philosophy as we apply it to God in natural theology. And he nodded, and I said, so we can understand how God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent, but humans have power too, even if it's finite and limited. And he nodded, and I said, likewise, God is all-knowing. Humans have knowledge, but it too is finite. And once again, he agreed. And I said, we'd also ascribe goodness and mercy all merciful one is one of the 99 titles for Allah. And so we have power, we have knowledge, we have goodness, we have mercy, and we have love that God has for his creatures. And I said, now, why not bundle these divine attributes together and just attach this idea of fatherhood by way of analogy? And he was staring intently back in my face, and he said, because Allah does not love as a father. And so to clarify, he pointed out that he had just finished a doctorate at Temple University, and I congratulated him on that accomplishment. He said, that's not my point. I'm moving to take a postdoctoral fellowship at the State University of New York. And where I live in Philadelphia, I've had a pet dog for the first time in my life. I love my dog. It's my dog. But where I've just signed a lease up in New York, they allow no pets. And so I've tried to get rid of my dog, and I can't seem to find anybody, and so I may have to kill my dog. And I thought he was joking at first, and so I, with love like that, who needs hate? <laughs> he wasn't even slightly amused. 
he had made his point. And so I'm looking back at him, swallowing hard, and after gulping, I'm like, okay, so Allah does not love as a father. I understand. And so we just tried our best to find a way to salvage the conversation. And about four or five minutes elapsed before I said, and to this day, I don't know what it was, and my brother-in-law doesn't remember either. But this third time, his fist came down, and this time he stood up, and he said, I've asked you once and twice, not a third time, and he stormed out. And the restaurant, which had three or four customers at this point, was just stunned in silence. The waitress came over and asked if we were ready to order. <laughs> we had both lost our appetites. <laughs> so we paid for the coffee, and then we went out and sat in his little orange Honda Civic, stunned in silence, for almost five minutes before my Baptist brother-in-law turned to me and said, Scott, I don't think I've ever appreciated what it means to say, our Father who art in heaven. And I said, I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And he said, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. These subversive acts of confessional Christianity bound us together, but they also serve to illuminate us because so often it takes an outsider to show us on the inside what we have taken for granted practically all of our lives. And that is the idea of God's fatherhood. This age-old paradigm that really transcends the master-slave relationship. But as we've already heard from Tim, we can also sense that we're going through a period of crisis. And so often I'm convinced we have divine providence supplying us with challenges that are meant to awaken us to the greatness of our faith. Before he became Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, and I quote, the crisis of fatherhood which we are living through today constitutes the heart of the human crisis that is threatening us. This is not a man given to hyperbole. He doesn't overstate anything. The crisis of fatherhood which we are living through today constitutes the heart of the human crisis that is threatening us. And after becoming our Holy Father, Pope Benedict went on to emphasize the need to renew our own covenant bond with God the Father through the Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit, but most especially by recognizing the mystery of love that he gave us in the Holy Family, the family at Nazareth. On the Feast of the Holy Family, back in 2010, he says, and I quote, God has chosen to reveal himself by being born into a human family, and the human family thus became an icon of God. God is the Trinity. He is a communion of love. So is the family, despite all the differences that exist between the mystery of God and his human creature, an expression that reflects the unfathomable mystery of God as love. The human family, I repeat, is, in a certain sense, an icon of the Trinity because of its interpersonal love and the fruitfulness of this love. These are the words of a professional theologian who knows how to apply the principle of analogy properly. It isn't the same thing, but it is analogous. And more recently, Pentecost Sunday, Pope Francis said the central purpose of Jesus' mission, which culminates in the gift of the Holy Spirit, is to renew our relationship with God the Father a relationship severed by sin, to take us from our state of being orphaned children to restore us as his sons and daughters. The Spirit is given to us by the Father and leads us back to the Father, and the entire work of salvation is thus one of regeneration, in which the fatherhood of God, through the gift of the Son and the Holy Spirit, frees us from the condition of being orphans into which we've fallen. And he just goes on from there. And so what we recognize in the teachings of these holy fathers that we have learned so much from is this idea that God is a father, not like a father, but more of a father than any dad could ever be. And yet the principle of analogy works in different ways. The first step of theological analogies is always the notion of similitude, similarity. That is what we call the the via causalitatis, that is, the similarity between the cause and the effect, the creator and the creature. Yet at the same time, we learn from the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 that the dissimilarity that exists between the creator and the creature is always much greater than any similarity. 
And so the second step of any theological analogy is to focus on the dissimilarity, to purify our notions that we might apply to God. And then the third and final step is the way of transcendence, the via eminency, that whatever is still true of God is truer of God than it is of us. So we can do this in a, a kind of process because as soon as you hear that God is a father, I think everyone recognizes what we're talking about. To be a father, you have to be a male. You have to have a body. You have to also have an organ and perform an act with your spouse, and that is fatherhood. That isn't rocket science, that's common sense. And yet, when we apply it to God, we recognize that he has no gender, he doesn't have a body or an organ, doesn't perform an act with a spouse, and so therefore, what must we conclude? That he's not really a father. That this is a figure of speech, a sort of metaphor that we project onto the deity to kind of domesticate him, correct? Absolutely wrong. What we have to do is purify our inadequate notions of fatherhood in order to grasp how it's truer of God than it is of us. Because fatherhood is not primarily physical or bodily or genital. It is primarily spiritual. It is more theological than it is biological. It is something of an eternal mystery. In fact, the great scholastic mystic, the second Augustine, one of my favorite theologians, Hugh of St. Victor of the School of St. Victor there in Paris, in his book, De Sacramentis, on the sacraments of the Christian faith, the first medieval scholastic text to refer to itself as a summa says, and I quote, human fatherhood is a sacramentum. And what does he mean? Well, sacramentum is not one of the seven sacraments. He's using that term in a more generic sense, that a sacramentum is an oath, an oath, a covenant oath. It's the constituent act by which you make a covenant. If you exchange promises, you have a contract. But if you invoke the holy name of God, then and only then do you enter into a covenant. And that oath that is sworn, the Latin word for which is sacramentum. So in a sense, a promise is a pledge, whereas an oath, a sacramentum, is a plea. Every sort of oath that we have in the society today is a kind of public prayer. One legal scholar refers to the oath as an ancient ruin still standing, another a relic of ancient piety. But wherever people are called upon to serve the common good, to perform some sort of sacrificial duty, they swear an oath. So help me God. There is a real sense in which fatherhood is a mystery, or as Hugh refers to it, as a sacramentum. What do I mean? Well, on the one hand, he points out that animals generate and the male animals, of course, provide the seed. But when egg and sperm unite for horses and cows and dogs and cats, the integral nature is communicated. The canine, the feline, the bovine, and so on. But none of them ever become persons. So animals generate, and we may apply fatherhood to the males of the species, but technically speaking, it isn't fatherhood because they're not persons made in the image and likeness of God. They don't know what is true in order to love what is good and to enter into interpersonal bonds of communion. On the other hand, angels are also sharing the image of God, and they're capable of knowing what is true and choosing the good and loving, but they're pure spirits, and they're not capable of generation. So they're persons who can't generate. These animals can generate, but they're not persons. Humans find themselves sort of awkwardly situated betwixt and between. We're like angels because we're persons who know and love. We're like animals with bodies because we copulate, we procreate, but when human egg and sperm unite, is the integral human nature transmitted? No, the church teaches that the human body is formed for that infant, but where does the soul come from? The soul is created by God, ex nihilo and even more, the mystery of each person. And so when you make a promise or a pledge, you say, I will do this. But when you swear an oath, you're basically pledging to do something that you can't do on your own. So help me God. As I witnessed my wife swearing her oath of office after she won, 
the election in Steubenville for the city council position in a landslide. It didn't matter. She didn't take office until she swore the oath of office. So help me God, as I held the Bible, I witnessed this commitment of hers. And so every act of fatherhood is a kind of sacramentum. We supply the sperm, she supplies the egg, but God supplies the soul, the spiritual substance and the mystery of the human person. So what we think we know, we don't really know. We know it in an analogous way. But we've got to be careful lest we have the created tail wag the uncreated dog because the fact is fatherhood exists in God alone in its perfection. This is what St. Paul's referring to. I bow my knees before the Father in heaven from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named or derived. Our fatherhood is a participation in his, but his fatherhood alone is perfect and eternal. And this is God's truest identity. We can't reduce God down to our creator, for that would make his existence and his nature dependent upon creatures. And we believe in divine aseity, that he is self-existent, apart from creation. But who God is, apart from creation, we wouldn't know unless he revealed himself. But that's exactly what he does through the patriarchs, through the law, and the prophets, and all of the promises that he came to fulfill when he sent his son to give us the Holy Spirit. So the revelation of God's fatherhood is the mystery that comes to us in the fullness of time only when this eternal son is born of the father. So father is more than a noun. It's a verb. It's more than a title. It's an eternal action. He is eternal father because he's eternally fathering. And so the son isn't younger. He isn't smaller. He's not dependent upon the father like children upon their parents. He is God from God, true God from true God, because he is begotten, not made. Whereas we, as creatures, even though God creates our souls out of nothing and fashions our, per our personhood as a gift of love, nevertheless, he gives us human nature, not divine nature. He gives us a spiritual substance that forms the soul of human persons. We don't constitute ourselves as divine persons. So even though God is more of your father than your own dad because he provided your soul, nevertheless, it's human soul, not divine. So even there, he's still functioning as our creator. So we have to clarify and purify our thoughts by way of analogy, not only to communicate to outsiders for whom God is simply a creator, a, a lawgiver, a lord, a master, to whom we relate exclusively as slaves, as divine property. All of that would be true apart from the, the grace of Jesus Christ, apart from the plan of the mystery of Christ that Paul writes about throughout all of Ephesians. But what we can see is the eternal son is eternally begotten, not made. Now, Tim has nine. I have six kids. I have five sons and one daughter. As I say, one rose and five thorns. Yeah. <laughs> None of them look like me, and I've never heard any of them complain about that. <laughs> but suppose I just gave in to vanity, and I just decided to have a seventh child. You know, and I wanted it to look just like me. Well, we're both turning 60 this year, so that won't happen by any natural means. And so instead, I'm going to get some bronze and sculpt it into the living likeness and put it out in my front yard, and everyone who passes by will see my seventh child, who looks just like the old man. Well, nobody would be fooled, because everybody who passes by would see a statue, not a child, because it's made, not begotten. It's got metallic nature, not human nature. And so a little philosophy goes a long way, and this is where we see a, a, a kind of marriage of reason and faith to illuminate what it is that the mysteries of faith reveal to us. Because the Trinity is not only the only God that exists, but the Trinity is the only thing God is from all eternity. And thus, as we read in the Catechism, paragraph 234, it is the highest mystery and the only mystery which illuminates all the other mysteries. For if the Trinity is the only God that exists and the only thing God eternally is, then it's the only thing that will explain all of the things that he does. 
in making us in his image and likeness, as we read in Genesis 1 verse 26, informing us to live in a family in the likeness of our creator. That's a mystery that awaits the incarnation to realize for us how true it really was. But it's one thing to be made in the image and likeness of God in the Old Covenant. It's another thing for us to discover the one who is the image of God, which is the New Covenant. As we hear in Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Not the first created, as Arius taught in heresy, but as Athanasius said, he is the firstborn because he's eternally begotten of the Father and thus the heir to all of those creatures that have been fashioned. And so as we look upon this mystery, we come to realize that God has given us all fathers so that we can come to know him for who he is. But he's given us all fathers who have failed us, who've let us down. I mean, except for my kids. <laughs> What's so funny? No. No, if you ask them, they will also acknowledge my many flaws. But the fact is, he's given us all fathers who have flaws, not only so that we'll learn to forgive them, but so that we'll recognize that there is only one true and perfect father. And the fathers who have failed us, the fathers who have manifest flaws, are also sometimes replaced by coaches or by teachers or by pastors, and especially at a place like Christendom College where teachers really do function in loca parentis to kind of continue the education and the formation which you have provided for them throughout their lives at home. But the fact is, all of these father figures are like rungs in a ladder by which we ascend into heaven to discover the face of the only true and perfect father from all eternity. So this gives us a dignity as fathers that we would never possess on our own, but it also gives us a dependency upon the only perfect Father that we have got to deepen in our devotion as beloved sons and daughters. And this also illuminates to me what is the essential reality about our faith as Catholic Christians. As we move from the, the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, you go back to the beginning in the Old Testament Genesis 1. And we hear all about how God created. Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. And the word that is applied to God in Genesis 1 is Elohim, the generic Hebrew word for deity. And then suddenly we discover at the end of chapter 1, the beginning of Genesis 2, that he rested on the seventh day. He consecrates. He hallows. He sanctifies the seventh day. It's the only time the word holiness occurs in all 50 chapters of Genesis. And then he blesses it. And of course... We all know what the seventh day is. It is the Sabbath, which for ancient Israelites was the sign of the covenant. And so in Hebrew, to swear a covenant is literally Shavah, to seven yourself. As we see in Genesis 21, when Abraham presents seven lambs to Abimelech to swear the very first covenant between two humans to avert violence and rivalry. The day before they swore the oath, they were almost at war. The day after they swore the oath, they referred to each other as brothers in Genesis 21, 31. So how do they do it? Seven lambs. Where do they do it? Bear Shiva. Look at the bottom of your page. It'll say, well of the oath, well of the covenant, or well of the seven. So the Sabbath, the seventh day, doesn't tell us how much clock time it took for God to make the world. Rather, for ancient Jews, it tells us why he made it. It's for the covenant. It goes beyond the creator-creature relationship. It's to establish a kind of kinship bond that is utterly sacred. When you look at ancient Near Eastern religions, you'll discover what my editor, David Noel Friedman, found. He was a Jewish scholar of the Hebrew Bible for more than 50 years, and he studied ancient Near Eastern documents. There isn't a single example of ever entering into a covenant with a supreme deity in any religion much less having the supreme deity initiate that covenant. So how significant is it for the ancient Jews to read that God blesses the seventh day, he hallows it, and he rests upon it and invites us as creatures to become his children. He invites us to recognize that the covenant is that for which we've been made. And so fittingly in Genesis 2, what name change does God undergo? 
No longer is he Elohim. Only in Genesis 2 is he now referred to as Yahweh Elohim, or as our translations render it, the Lord God. For Yahweh is that Hebrew name that we translate Lord, but it can only be invoked by those who are in the family, who are in a covenant. And so this is the whole point of the creation narrative. It's not how much clock time or what scientific processes were involved, but what is God's fatherly purpose? And that's revealed in the Sabbath. And so when we look at this through the eyes of faith, we recognize not just God, our creator, Elohim, but we also recognize something more than Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. Because all of that is true for the old covenant, where God initiates this bond with his own people. And then he invites them to renew that bond, to enter into a covenant in response. But he's always the one who initiates the bond. And then he always invites us freely to renew that covenant, to enter into it on our own free will, knowing that we're going to break it, knowing that he'll have to renew it through his mercy, which is more than pity. It's more than pardon. It's more than cheap grace. As St. Thomas Aquinas described the mercy of God, it is his all-powerful love in action. So this is how he makes and keeps his covenant with us. He binds himself to us, and then he invites us to bind ourselves to him, knowing we're going to let go. It reminds me of an experience that I had many years ago when our only daughter, Hannah, and all of the other kids were crossing the street. Now, we were going to a Pittsburgh Pirates game, but we had to park across the river, and it was rush hour. And so we had a little family ritual, and when we crossed a busy street, that Kimberly would be on one end and I would be on the other and then beginning with the oldest and going down to the youngest. And at the time, our daughter Hannah was the youngest. So we all held hands. And when the light turned green, we crossed Liberty Avenue, the busiest street in downtown Pittsburgh. Suddenly, in the corner of my eye, I see a pickup truck running the red light. Right turn on red. I don't know what he was thinking, but he was barreling right for us. And right before we had crossed, I said, OK, Let's hold hands. Let's lock hands. Hold tight, Hannah. And she did. And I held her hand tight. But as soon as that truck came for us, I heard her scream and I felt her let go. And what did I do? You want to feel what a front fender of a Ford pickup is like? Go right ahead, girl. No, I didn't. <laughs> I squeezed even tighter and I pulled her back as this truck raced by. And she screamed out of fear, I thought. But no. She looked up at me and said, you hurt me. <laughs> I'm like, I hurt you. I saved your life, girl. And I scooped her up and she said, it's all red. And then we crossed and by the time I got over, I thought she'd get over it. Instead, she makes me put her down. She runs to her mother, daddy hurt me. <laughs> she scoops up the daughter and says, daddy helped you. You let go. It wasn't until the fourth inning she forgave me and came back to me and sat on my lap for the rest of the game. But the fact is, God is like that, only more. He binds himself to us, invites us to bind ourselves to him, knowing that out of fear, out of weakness, out of ignorance, whatever it is that tempts us, we're going to let go. And so the old covenant is a pattern. It's a, a sequence of covenants that are renewed and then subsequently broken by all of the human mediators. Noah in his drunkenness in Genesis 9. Abraham takes an Egyptian handmaid for a concubine in Genesis 16. And as you continue reading about Moses' temper tantrum being excluded from the promised land and David's adultery and having Uriah murdered, as it were, on the front lines, it isn't until we get out of the old and into the new that we see the fulfillment occurring properly. And of course, we all know how the new is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed and fulfilled by the new. But what I think we have to recognize is just how new the new covenant really is. Even 2,000 years after it was ratified, and I consult the rabbis for some assistance here because the rabbis for ages have always been fond of counting the number of times important words occur. And with, of course, now with computer technology, it's a lot easier. Recently, I discovered that the term Elohim occurs in the Hebrew Bible approximately 2,600 times, whereas the term in Hebrew for Lord, Yahweh, occurs more than 7,000 times. And then the rabbis also point out that the term 
for God as Father occurs in the Hebrew Bible a grand total of 17 times. 17 times is significant. But it's only 17, which is a paltry sum in comparison to 2,600 for Elohim or over 7,000 for Yahweh. 17 times. In the Old Covenant, he is the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the Old Covenant, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We're the, we're the sheep of his pasture. He cares for his flock better than fathers do for their own families. But he's not our father. That's only figurative. It's a metaphor. It's a kind of promise but it isn't even clear that the promise is anything more than a figure of speech. It isn't until the Father sends the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the old and establish the new that suddenly we realize something entirely new, that the new fulfills the old in a way that exceeds their highest hopes. It surpasses their wildest dreams. And how do we find it? Because in Jesus' very first sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, there in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Guess what he calls God? Father. Guess how many times? 17. Count them up. His first sermon. 17 times is the grand total of the Hebrew Bible, and he's just getting started. Throughout his public ministry, over 180 references to God as Father. In Gethsemane, he prays to Abba Father, a kind of term of endearment, which means Papa. And then in his last discourse, what we find in the upper room in John 14 through 17, he refers to God as Father 51 times. That's three times 17 if you're poor at math like I am. And so we don't even notice. It's like white noise, like crickets chirping. We just kind of project it onto the back, you know, in the, we project it onto the Old Testament, and then we just kind of assume there's continuity when in fact, as we see in John 5, after Jesus healed the paralytic by the poolside who'd been there for 38 years, on the Sabbath, they asked him why, and he explained, because my father's working still. And then we read, this is why they sought all the more to kill him, because he not only healed on the Sabbath, but he called God Father, thus making himself equal to God. Even for the Jews of his day, that was blasphemous. You see how much we take for granted you see how much God accomplished. He didn't just fulfill the old. The new transcends and exceeds and surpasses it because it establishes sacred kinship bonds with God so that we read in Romans 8 and again in Galatians 4 that not only does Jesus pray to God as Abba, Father, but the Father sends the Son to give us the spirit of sonship so that the Spirit causes us to cry out, Abba, Father, in our prayer as well, and we find ourselves in Gethsemane. So this is who we 